I'm Cameron Consarinia, Policy Director at Nufti here in Washington, and welcome to the relaunch of Iran Uncovered, a podcast by Nufti. It's a pleasure to be joined this season by my friend and colleague, Dr. Saeed Qasemnejad. Uh, Saeed, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm fine. Thank you. Good and great to be with you. Great to be with you. And uh, better than being together, uh, being with uh, our friend, uh, Dr. Shiwei Wang, uh, here with us in Washington. Good morning. How are you? Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for having me here. I uh, uh, just want to be make. Uh, just want to make sure I, 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 uh, I'm not a doctor yet. Hopefully, <laughs> one day uh, I will be. That's true. Good. Did he say you? Uh, did he say your name correct? Uh, yes. Yes. How does how do you do you say it the proper way? Uh, so Wang Xiwei. Wang Xiwei. Okay. Yes. Xiwei. Yes. Xiwei. Okay. Yes. Because I noticed in your writings, your byline, you, you put Wang Siwei as opposed to Siwei Wang. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm known uh, in Iran as a Ziyu. Ziyu. Yeah. <laughs> yeah because I, 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 I googled you last night and I thought there is, a, there is another Wang Siwei who is very famous, but it's a, uh, she's a professor at Nanjing University on agriculture or something like that. Oh, there are many people yeah. who have a name... Uh, I thought you were the most famous Wang Xiwei, but apparently not. <laughs> there's, 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 there's a fierce competition between these two. Maybe, maybe this episode can help boost uh, his popularity to, to the number one. She's doing some research on agriculture. She, she had like close to 4,000 citations. Wow. Oh, wow. I guess in a field like agriculture, it's a bit easier. Maybe it's kind of boring. Yeah. Um, well, we're, we're really uh, thankful that you joined us uh, for this first episode of our relaunch podcast and even a greater pleasure to have you in person. So again, thank you. Um, last night, you know, when Said and I were talking about this episode and when we talked with you about it, one of the things we really want to talk about is, is more about Sue, the person, beyond your whole experience and uh, things that maybe people know about you, your policy views, um, things like that. So last night we went out for Persian food with some friends here in Washington, yes. uh, and and you had what I think is a remarkable knowledge of of all the different aspects of of Iranian cuisine. So what was it like in Iran? I mean, did you travel to different parts of the country? Obviously, before your arrest, which which we'll get to, did you get to travel the country and try different cuisine? And uh, no, uh, unfortunately, I was only in Tehran. I never had a chance to travel outside of Tehran. Uh, uh, I never got a chance to see the beautiful country, unfortunately. Uh, I really hope in my lifetime I'll be able to go back uh, to Iran as a real guest and tour the country. Yeah. How long were you there before they picked you up? Uh, four months. Four months, okay. Yeah. But, but in that time, I mean, I remember once we were we were talking, I think maybe you gave an interview or something, and you said something about Calipache, and I was amazed that you knew the, even the most you know, intricate uh, uh, yes. Iranian dishes. Yes, I love Calipache. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's very good. I love it. Where, where did you live in Tehran? Uh, in Banak. Narmak? No, uh, Banak, Banak. Banak. The Narmak Ahmadinejad lives in Narmak. Ah. <laughs> yeah, when he was looking for apartments, he, he, stayed, he stayed far away from there. Right. Um, now, so, so you're well known, unfortunately, as a former American hostage in Iran. Um, but as you and I have talked about, and uh, as Said and I said, there's, there's so much more to you, obviously, personally, professionally, academically. You're pursuing your PhD. You're doing so many other things. You know, who, who is uh, Shiwei Wang beyond this really uh, unfortunate experience that happened to you? by the uh, Iranian regime? Uh, yes. What's, what, what's your story? So, um, obviously, uh, I'm Chinese-American. Uh, I came to the United States um, as an immigrant when I was uh, 20 years old. Uh, my family settled in Seattle, uh, Washington, uh, where I went to college for South Asian studies. There, I learned Urdu and Hindi. Uh, because of that connection, um, I got interested in Persian, uh, learned the Persian language, went to South Asia, uh, became interested in the uh, Persianate uh, connection uh, between South Asia and Central Asia. Um, and then that's how I got into uh, the study of uh, uh, Persianate sphere uh, and the Central Asian history. 
um, and I did um, a master's at Harvard um, uh, on uh, Russian and Eurasian studies uh, with a focus on, uh, again, uh, Central Asia. Uh, and then after Harvard, uh, I worked uh, for the International Red Cross uh, in Afghanistan as a, a Pashto interpreter uh, uh, between 2010 and 2011. Uh, in 2013, uh, I returned to the United States uh, to pursue um, a PhD studies uh, at uh, Princeton University, again on Central Asian, Central Eurasian history. Uh, that's kind of uh, the brief outline uh, of, 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 of my life uh, up to Princeton. I mean, to, to, to to decide to go, so when did you go to Afghanistan as a translator for the Red Cross? Uh, in 2010. 2010. And how did you, I mean, that's, with, with that many degrees from that many prestigious universities, obviously you could have done a lot. I mean, what, what drove you to go be an interpreter in a place like Afghanistan in a time like 2010? Uh, I, I was out of a job in, uh, in Hong Kong. <laughs> uh, it, well, actually, it's not a very easy for people who do humanities and uh, sure. social science. Um, uh, the, the job opportunities available to us uh, are, are, are limited. Uh, so uh, after my master's, I was considering law school. Uh, so uh, I was doing an internship um, uh, in an American law firm in Hong Kong. Um, but I decided I, I don't like doing IPO um, and, uh, and the serving uh, wealthy people. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but the, it, w it was a bad time. Uh, financial crisis hit Hong yeah. Kong really hard. Uh, so by the end of 2009, uh, I was about to uh, be unemployed. Uh, so I took two, week, uh, two weeks off uh, from my work in Hong Kong and uh, contacted some friends, Harvard uh, University of Washington friends uh, in Afghanistan, and I just um, took a vacation. Uh, to uh, 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 and travel to Afghanistan. You to took a vacation to Afghanistan. Yeah, then to look for work. Um, right. And there I um, I got a job offer with the Red Cross. Uh, I knew Pashto already. I wasn't fluent, um, but the Red Cross was kind enough uh, to uh, to be willing to uh, train me uh, to be an interpreter as I learned the language um, uh, while working. So that's how I became a Red Cross interpreter. Uh, I'm mainly stationed uh, in southern Afghanistan, uh, uh, Kandahar, uh, uh, and I travel around in uh, old Pashtun uh, uh, areas uh, in Afghanistan. Wow. Do, do you have friends or colleagues who got stuck there after what happened? Uh, in the past few months, or are most of your friends and colleagues able to get out? Um, the the Red Cross delegation in Afghanistan uh, today, I think, is still headed by um, uh, uh, one of my colleagues uh, at that time. Uh, he was a, a deputy chief of uh, delegation. I think now he's he's the the, the chief of uh, of delegation in Afghanistan. They are doing wonderful work, uh, humanitarian, helping the Afghans out. Um, I'm glad uh, that uh, they remain active um, and carrying out this uh, uh, important humanitarian work. Yeah, doing a lot more than the U.S. government, I'm sure, it seems. Yeah. Say, did you ever take a, a vacation to Afghanistan? No, unfortunately not. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's quite a place to, uh, to travel. And yeah, again, to a wonderful uh, country, uh, hospitable people, uh, beautiful uh, landscape, uh, it's just uh, very, very unfortunate to see uh, the country hasn't had any stability in the last couple of decades and things are not getting better. But I can see why the uh, our smuggler brothers in IRGC got very suspicious. Uh, did, did it come up in the interrogation? Um, Yes, a little bit, but not, they, they, were, they were not really concerned about what I did in Afghanistan. Well, I think what they, they were really interested in uh, was uh, my American passport. Uh, that, that's what made a difference. So, so can, can we go back to that uh, original you know, point? So you were in, Iran, in Tehran for four months, living yeah. in Vanak. What was, before you uh, are taken hostage, what was, what was your life like for those four months? Uh, I... Um, I went there as a uh, language student, uh, so uh, and a researcher. 
So I spent uh, most of my time at Behoda Institute uh, to learn Persian. Uh, and uh, uh, in the Iranian archives um, to read archival material to collect uh, research material. I already knew Persian. I just wanted to go there to improve my Persian. Uh, so I was busy uh, uh, studying and uh, researching. Uh, and um, I was so much focused on my work. Uh, and um, uh, this, is, uh, this was also in a, uh, a short spurt of uh, optimism uh, under JCPOA. Uh, the, the hope was the US and Iran uh, will maintain a amicable uh, relations under uh, the nuclear agreement. So I was hopeful and um, I thought I would be able to return to Iran, uh, do more research and eventually um, travel around in the country um, uh, and enjoy wonderful Iran. Uh, but unfortunately that never came, uh, uh, that never came forth. And um, uh, so I was busy working uh, on my language study and my research work uh, uh, in that trip um, until a uh, couple of hours before I was supposed to leave the country. Uh, the Iranian intelligence uh, called me uh, claiming to be Iranian police and they asked me to go to the diplomatic police station uh, uh, near Feridosi. Uh, for uh, questioning. Uh, you know, in authoritarian countries, uh, uh, this is not uncommon. So I, 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 it didn't raise my suspicion. I, I took my passport uh, and a computer. I just went to the designated location. There, um, my passport and computer uh, were uh, confiscated. Uh, they questioned me for about three hours uh, and told me uh, we will look into uh, what you have done in Iran further. So you're not going home today. Go back to your residence uh, and uh, wait for further communication. That's uh, that was a shock to me. Uh, that's that's uh, that's how things started uh, to go towards a terrible uh, direction. Did you feel that they were following you during that four months at any point or? Uh, so, as you know, there were no American presence uh, in Iran, uh, and then uh, uh, I got no logistic support. Uh, uh, so when I arrived, uh, my Chinese friends put me in touch uh, uh, with uh, uh, the local Chinese community, uh, some businessmen and journalists there, um, and then uh, uh, so I visited uh, a, uh, a Chinese contact. Uh, later on, uh, she told me uh, that she's been in Iran by that time already for seven, seven, eight years. And then she said, uh, for first time, uh, a Iranian, the, the Iranian intelligence came to my door asking me who, whom I was, uh, whom I met. So I believe they refer to you. Mm. So you should be careful. But again. Uh, I was just a student. Uh, I was non-political. Uh, non-political. I uh, uh, I never said or written. Uh, I've never said or written anything uh, about or against Iran. So I thought, as long as uh, I remain a low-profile, uh, non-political, uh, and just to fo just just focus on my work, uh, I I should be left alone. Uh, especially given uh, the context of. Uh, uh, improving relations between the United States and Iran under the uh, nuclear deal, uh, the so-called uh, JCPOA. Uh, but apparently uh, I was naive uh, and uh, uh, underestimated uh, the, the risk uh, that I was facing. So how, how big is the Chinese community in Iran? I'm asking because I left Iran in 2008. So a lot has changed probably, but I can't remember like seeing a big, large Chinese community in Tehran. Is it, is it at that point, was it large or, or is it like a small community? Um, well, there are a lot of Chinese. Uh, so, um, I, I would say it's a pretty sizable, very visible 
uh, uh, Chinese presence, uh, in, in especially I think in places like Tehran. Uh, you see them uh, uh, nearly everywhere. Uh, and then when people uh, saw me, Iranians saw me on the street, uh, the, the first thing they would think uh, that you're Chinese. Uh, you're not American. Not 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 Japanese. Not Korean. Mm. You're certainly Chinese because the the the, the Chinese presence there is rather uh, visible. Uh, when, when I tell them, in fact, uh, you know, when I told them I'm American, they, they say, no, 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 you're Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and what was that? A lot of. Go ahead, say. Uh, and are they like mostly in business or doing like research? What are they um, doing there? There are many. Uh, I think pre predominantly business people uh, doing all kinds of business, and then there are a lot of travelers uh, because it's easier. It's easy for Chinese to travel to Iran, uh, and um, uh, and there are students as well. Uh, uh, I think in the, uh, in Dehoda, I think uh, it is safe to say one third of the foreign students were Chinese. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, and. Uh, uh, there are also Chinese students in other universities, University of Tehran. Uh, so uh, they're doing everything. Um, all kinds of people doing all kinds of different things uh, in, in, uh, in Iran. Well, you were obviously studying something very specific in the humanities, language, culture, mm -hmm. where if one third of the students in Dehoda were, were, <clears throat> were Chinese, were they, and, and as you say, in the University of Tehran, other schools, were they studying similar things? Were they doing more technical degrees? What were they studying? That's, that's really uh, they, they, well, first of all, they study Persian. Yeah. Um, and once, uh, so some some would learn Persian at Dehoda and become proficient mm -hmm. and then work for Chinese business interest uh, as, uh, as uh, translators, interpreters. Uh, and some would uh, uh, move into universities to do a degree. Or certificate uh, in uh, some other disciplines, um, uh, and then once they finish the university degree, they uh, some of them obviously uh, become uh, again uh, in the business world, uh, and then uh, some of them uh, would go into academia, become researchers, uh, or other things uh, mm -hmm. rather similar to uh, to America, what, what, sure. what they do in America. But they're uh, 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 all in all, there, there's a pretty good uh, size uh, Chinese community there. That's interesting because I, I, I went to the University of Tehran and I think many of these students who are uh, learning Persian probably go there too. I, I've never seen uh, any Chinese at the University of Tehran when, when I was there and I was there like for a few years, both masters and uh, undergrad there. That's that, that's right. I, I think uh, uh, things are changing uh, in recent years. Uh, at least up, to, up until two thousand fifteen and sixteen, you see a, a great number of Chinese uh, students. Uh, and then uh, there was a, a Iranian TV show, uh, very popular. I don't remember the name. Uh, they they show it uh, around uh, Novruz time. Uh, in one of the seasons, uh, there was even a Chinese uh, student. Uh, <laughs> In that show, like a, like a recurring character. Uh, you know, only in that season. Okay. Only that in that season, uh, she was uh, 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 she was doing her PhD in the University of Tehran uh, in real life, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then, uh, uh, but in the show that she married uh, a Iranian, <laughs> um, and then uh, she uh, um, she was on her way back to China. Uh, in the show again, mm -hmm. uh, and then and perished uh, in the Malaysian Airlines 370. Oh, wow. That's that's a story. Oh, wow. um, um, but she was uh, she was a main character uh, in the in the show. In the show, yeah. Wow, fascinating. Yeah. Um, but you you obviously did not marry an Iranian. You were you were uh, married. Right. I, I was I was I was married. My uh, my wife and son uh, were here uh, in the states, um, and uh, so I, I I went to Iran only for uh, studying and research. Mm -hmm. And how I mean before we even get to the you know the things that your wife and and your young son had to endure when you were in prison. What well, was it? Four months is, is a long time to be away from your wife and uh, and a, a young child. What, what was that? Like? Right in the middle, uh, I I returned to uh, to the U.S. Uh, uh, during the Iranian New Year. As you know, everywhere uh, was closed. I uh, couldn't do any work or study, so I returned here 
uh, and spend a month and a half, and went again uh, okay. for two and a half months uh, for my for my uh, for my research work. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then so yes, uh, it, it, it was difficult. Uh, so my wife had to uh, take care of my son. When I left uh, uh, the second time around, uh, my son just turned three. Uh, mm -hmm. So and now he's eight and a half. Uh, I was imprisoned uh, in Iran for exactly 40 months, uh, so I missed a good uh, four four year of uh, of my son's uh, young life. So, how is the process of an American student going to, to Iran? So, when you go tell the university, I'm I'm doing some research in Iran. Do they tell you this is like a difficult thing to do, the dangerous thing to do? Maybe you should not do it, or no. Uh, I know some universities uh, 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 told uh, their students not explicitly told their students not to go to Iran, uh, and then the professor would, would actually talk at length with the uh, with the students uh, to discourage them, uh, uh, or, you know, dissuade them from going to Iran to do any study and work. Uh, but uh, uh, but not not in my university. Uh, so um, I was not uh, a student of Iranian history uh, or Iran studies. Um, in fact, my field is uh, Soviet uh, Russian Soviet history, Central Asian history. I was looking at uh, possibly Afghanistan uh, and uh, Russian Central Asia. Uh, what I needed so my connection with Iran was only the Persian language. Uh, I wanted to go to Iran to do the Dehoda language program uh, for summer 2015 to uh, bring up uh, my Persian uh, proficiency so that uh, in early 2016, uh, I could go to Afghanistan and jump right into my research work uh, without spending too much time brushing up my language. Uh, so that was the plan. Uh, but uh, the Dehoda Institute ignored uh, my, my, my application, did not give me uh, my visa until November 2015. So by this time, uh, JCPOA has uh, come to being. Um, and uh, uh, under that uh, misplaced optimism, uh, uh, my professors at Princeton just encouraged me to uh, go to Iran to explore uh, research opportunities. Uh, uh, I accepted uh, the, the, the idea uh, because I was thinking like many, uh, that the JCPOA uh, was making a difference. With, without getting into necessarily specific universities or individuals, you talk about this, what you call misplaced optimism in regards to the JCPOA, and I imagine that extends beyond just the JCPOA, but you are a, a, a nearly lifelong academic with multiple degrees from multiple prestigious universities, and beyond that, you've had contact with other academics from other prestigious universities. What, what, is, what is your sense of how the American Academy, um, whether it's broadly or particularly Middle Eastern studies, Iranian studies, Persian aid studies, things of that nature, and the persons who work in the academy have in shaping how we as Americans broadly, or even yourself, how you viewed American relations with Iran or, or the region as a whole? Uh, well, that's a very, very good question. So again, I'm not a, uh, 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 I, I was not a student of Middle Eastern studies per se. Um, um, uh, I have taken a few courses, uh, Islamic studies, Middle Eastern history, uh, and, and things like that. Uh, and uh, I think it is fair to say um, um, the Middle Eastern, the field of uh, Near Eastern, Middle Eastern studies in America uh, uh, is very dominated uh, by the Saidian, Edward Said, Saidian uh, 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 rhetoric, um, uh, meaning uh, Western imperialism from the British uh, French empires to uh, U.S. superpower uh, post uh, World War II um, uh, in the Middle East uh, explains uh, away everything that happened uh, in the Middle East, um, uh, and then uh, everything is to be blamed uh, on the West. 
especially in case of uh, Iran. Uh, it is so common, uh, as, all, as you all know, uh, uh, almost everyone in the academia uh, talks about the current state of uh, U.S.-Iran relations start from 1953, right? Uh, Sa Said loves to talk about that. Uh, that yes. That's his favorite, his favorite topic. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, never mind. Uh, if you look into the nitty-gritty details, uh, you just find um, the, 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 the actual historical events, the background uh, and everything. It's, it's not that straightforward as those who just put forward uh, the argument America, CIA, toppled uh, democratically elected uh, 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 Iranian government. Uh, that's, that's, that's factually not the case. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, of course, here, here we're, we're not going to uh, have a historical discussion about that. Uh, I'm just saying um, uh, history is much more nuanced. Um, uh, it became, uh, so when I went to Iran, uh, I bought into this idea uh, that America did everything wrong uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Iran, with regard to Iran. Uh, the, the, attitude, the U.S. attitude towards Iran is condescending and imperialist. Um, and I believed that the JCPOA uh, that the Obama administration did was a very uh, positive uh, step uh, forward to right America's wrong. And that certainly will have a positive effect on the uh, Iranian behavior, uh, the regime's behavior, I mean. Uh, uh, meaning, uh, at least uh, at, at, at a personal level, if, if I don't offend the regime, I should be left alone to do my work. Uh, but not even that minimum uh, uh, was, uh, was, was, was uh, you know, I, I didn't even get that minimum right, right? Uh, uh, so uh, it is, uh, I think the biggest, the, the biggest lesson I learned through my experience in Iran is just how biased uh, the American academia uh, has been uh, in the uh, generally in the field of Middle Eastern studies, but also specifically on Iran. This is not to say that the uh, there was nothing right about the dominant predominant academic thinking or rhetoric. Uh, what I want to emphasize is the fact that they miss half of the picture. Right. So you can talk at length um, about how wrong the U.S. behaved towards Iran, but there's another half of the picture. Uh, uh, from the uh, from the Iranian uh, uh, perspective, and they have their own agency. They have their own reasons, uh, their ideologies uh, that determine the way they behave. And uh, I think there is a um, um, lack of uh, appreciation uh, of that aspect uh, in uh, uh, in our academic uh, 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 study um, about Iran, uh, about Middle East. So basically, we overemphasize Western agency uh, towards the Middle East, uh, but we de-emphasize or ignore uh, the the local agency uh, that made uh, uh, that, in my opinion, uh, equally important in making their history. Well, and and you said that the, the that dominant view is based on an assumption of um, American condescension in the past, but but that view itself. And the the almost uh, elimination of agency of the local population of Iranians in the, in this case, that in of itself is is actually condescending. No, saying that Iranians have no agency. Everything that happens is because these Iranians are still angry about something that happened seventy years ago. They can't control their temper. Right. See, this is subtle, right? They don't say the uh, uh, academics don't say the Iranians don't have agency, or they don't just they, they just don't talk about the Iranian agency in these events. They talk about. The U.S. agency. So you hear about how the CIA toppled Mossadegh. You don't hear about uh, uh, the the, uh, the roles of the Iranians. Uh, you know the clerics. Mm -hmm. How the clerics turned against Mossadegh, right? And uh, uh, how or the, the people on the streets. Uh, yeah, and, and how the Iranian law uh, uh, yeah. worked at that time. Uh, and for example, the fact that uh, uh, Mossadegh's own uh, uh, authoritarian uh, tendency. So these things tend to be. Uh, ignored, uh, uh, whereas the U.S. agency, British agency, Russian agency uh, uh, are emphasized. Mm. Uh, and I think this is uh, 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 largely uh, misleading. 
And in my, in my, uh, from my personal perspective, this is not only misleading at the academic level, it, has, it can have a real human impact. Uh, for example, you, I, you know, uh, I, I was deeply con uh, convicted that the, 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 what I learned in the ivory tower uh, uh, was essentially right. Uh, without that belief, um, I couldn't have uh, committed to studying Iran, uh, going to Iran uh, in that juncture of, of time, um, and take immense risks, right, uh, in retrospect. Um, uh, so I, I truly believed uh, in what I learned. Um, but then when, when I went to Iran, um, by talking to Iranian people on the street, uh, I'm seeing how Iran uh, works and then after I was jailed, my interaction through uh, with the Iranian authorities, my interaction through my interaction with the um, uh, Iranian prisoners from uh, all walks of life, I learned just so much, because Iranians inside of Iran certainly have a different perspective. Uh, they don't look at uh, uh, their their relation vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, vis-a-vis -vis the United States, solely from an American perspective, we're learning uh, uh, in this country. So that was uh, uh, revelatory uh, uh, to me. Uh, I, I learned just so much, uh, and uh, and then that uh, convinced me uh, that we what what we are teaching uh, in uh, university classrooms here is inadequate. Uh, we miss important. 50% um, that can have a real policy and human consequences. So, Said, what has have you had the, the the same experience? I mean, obviously you have been in academia, but in a in a more finance and economics. But you know, having been at a think tank for for several years, have you had the the same experience uh, as as Shui uh, about the American Academy and what it's teaching uh, American students? Not in finance, I think finance. No, but but beyond that, I mean, I mean, in, in, in terms of your interaction with other academics on on this topic. Uh, so when I was at university, so at university, I only talked to finance and economic professors, so not really. But outside the university, he, he's right. I think it's very difficult to have a different point of view, and it's becoming. Uh, it's getting worse and worse, I think, like in social, social science, humanities. I have a question. So you said you your line of study was Soviet study studies. Is it the same in the Soviet studies or it's something very much concentrated in the Middle Eastern studies? Uh, so, uh, yes. So when Soviet Union was there, uh, this, this was uh, 30 years ago, right? Uh, so when Soviet Union still existed, uh, sh even shortly after, um, there was this academic trend uh, that explains uh, uh, because the biggest thing in Soviet studies is about, you know it, the the revolution, right? Uh, and and uh, uh, how the revolution uh, unfolded uh, and what happened afterwards. So there there was uh, I would say very dominant uh, 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 view. Um, uh, that says the revolution uh, was uh, somehow redeemable, right? It just the Bolshevik revolution. The, yeah, the Bolshevik revolution, uh, the 1917. All right, so it, it's somehow redeemable. It's just uh, in the in the in the in the in the, the decades of, uh, uh, followed uh, uh, because of the uh, circumstances, uh, things went astray. Uh, but the the, the 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 whole idea of revolution. Uh, the way it was carried out, the early days of the revolution, they were very positive, uh, uh, very positive things. Uh, uh, real changes were being made, um, and uh, uh, again, uh, in a nutshell, it's not all bad. Uh, there are uh, aspects of it are quite uh, were quite good. Uh, offered the hope uh, 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 that the revolution. Uh, was a uh, world, uh, world transforming uh, of world transform uh, 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 transforming nature. Uh, so uh, yes, so there's uh, uh, there are many uh, scholars who are sympathetic uh, hmm. towards the Russian Revolution, um, and uh, I, I think uh, similar uh, to the Middle Eastern studies, 
uh, that many scholars are uh, sympathetic mm -hmm. uh, to uh, uh, the Middle Easterners um, uh, for you know for what has happened uh, in their history. Yes. Beyond academia, in in the field of journalism, sticking with this theme of comparison between the Soviet period and the Islamic Republic in Iran, um, you're obviously familiar with uh, Walter Duranty, and I think probably lots of people who study Soviet Union, I hope, are. Again, with, we don't have to get into names or people, but you know, I think we all know <laughs> who they are. It, do you, are there people who are the Walter Durantys of Iran journalism, and and if you wouldn't mind, just for our you know viewers, listeners who maybe don't know who Walter Duranty is or what role he played, can you explain that the, the importance that that he played, the role he played rather in U.S. discourse on Soviet Union, and do you see uh, that there are similar people uh, playing a role in the American discourse on Iran or the Islamic Republic today? Well, uh, well, I don't Generally. know uh, very much about uh, uh, Walter Durandi's mm -hmm. uh, uh, history per se, sure. and this 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 is very frequently uh, mentioned, especially uh, by uh, Iranians who are really concerned uh, about how Iran, uh, how the Islamic Republic of Iran is presented uh, to the Western uh, uh, society, um, uh, because um, uh, the the. Uh, for, 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 for Iranians, uh, the regime is corrupt, uh, oppressive. But again, um, uh, in the views of uh, some uh, pro-engagement uh, uh, activists in the West, um, the, the, the revolution, again, to start with, uh, the, 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 the Islamic revolution in 1979 uh, is somehow redeemable. Uh, the, 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 the intention, the objectives uh, were sound. Um, and then there were uh, some some astrays, uh, um, but that cannot cancel out uh, the positive aspects of of uh, of uh, the uh, the revolution and what uh, uh, came after, especially from uh, 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 your uh, left wing uh, progressive uh, uh, academics. Um, uh, we all know there were uh, there there are some important books about uh, contemporary uh, history of Iran. Um, so uh, and many of these uh, uh, books uh, um, uh, ha have a, have a standpoint uh, to justify or um, uh, legitimize uh, the uh, Iranian uh, revolution in 1979. And talk about how much uh, uh, you know the, the, the achievement uh, uh, after uh, the revolution, uh, as if uh, it was uh, the revolution that brought uh, those achievements. Uh, a, a, a very interesting um, aspect that I heard in Iran repeatedly is the Iranians. Uh, the Iranians are, are well aware, are, you know, well-read, uh, uh, educated Iranians. They're well aware uh, of the Western. Rhetoric, because these things also translated to, got translated into right. Persian, right? Uh, and then they, they read this kind of literature, and so they said uh, uh, many times. Uh, uh, Iranians told me this is this is so wrong uh, because the rhetorics like this uh, uh, is as uh, as if uh, had there not been the Islamic Revolution, had there not been this oppressive regime, we wouldn't have had any uh, progress uh, in this country. Uh, uh, that that's like an insult uh, to yeah. the to, to 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 the Iranian nation, uh, and I think they they have other point. Uh, 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 so um, I think the um, but but again uh, from the liberal progressive view, this is very typical. Again, um, uh, the revolution isn't all that bad. It, it has a lot of redeem uh, redeemable qualities. Um, but I think that misses the point, yeah. right? That misses the point that the uh, the, re the regime in and unto itself is oppressive and has obstructed uh, uh, the the development of of the Iranian nation uh, and the welfare uh, and the and the welfare of the Iranian people. So I, I asked about the Soviet because I was listening to an interview with a chair professor and the chair was in name of a, I'm not going to name, but it was, it was named after a very anti-Soviet senator. 
And this professor was so much pro-Soviet that it was like, it was very funny. Like, you know, like, <laughs> like being, having a chair, for example, after Churchill and then being pro-Hitler. So I, probably it's the same pattern we see in the Middle Eastern studies, we see in the Soviet studies these days too. Yes, so you see the 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 uh, so the Nazis and the Hitler uh, have been totally discredited. Um, uh, completely. No, no, he was he was just to to make it clear he was not pro Hitler he was pro Stalin. So this is, this is what I'm saying. So like like the the, the, the Nazis and the the, uh, the, the uh, and Hitler are completely discredited. It is unmanageable. Uh, unimaginable uh, to to uh, for, you know for someone to say uh, for for someone to come out and defend what Nazis or right. Hitler did, um, but it is still quite uh, quite common. I I I, I would say uh, for someone to say uh, the communist revolution was good, um, at least the intention was good, uh, uh, and then there is no shortage of people the, uh, today. Uh, that would tell you the Islamic Revolution uh, uh, ha, ha, had a, a very, very good aspect. It, uh, it pushed out uh, the, uh, 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 the, the the Shah, uh, the, the dictator, right? Um, it advanced uh, 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 Iranian uh, uh, society and made Iran a great power in the region, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but Put this in the grand scheme of things. I think it just it misses the point because because we uh, have a tendency in this country is that we don't live in Iran, right? Uh, most of Americans, most liberal progressive um, uh, left. I mean, even many Iranian Americans um, who are uh, oblivious to the uh, of the fact that we can talk about. This issue, uh, pros and cons uh, about revolution, uh, the Islamic revolution, Russian revolution, here um, in the United States, while we're enjoying the freedom and the material comfort we're having today here, uh, but it is a, a matter of a real life, uh, real suffering for Iranians uh, living in Iran. This is a day-to-day -day, um, suffering, right? Um, they don't like the regime. They see clearly uh, the problem uh, that they have to deal with. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, stifled uh, 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 progress, stifled uh, call for uh, freedom, um, and, and uh, missed opportunities. Um, but here we sitting in America, we don't, we don't feel that, mm. unfortunately. For us, it's academics, it, it, it's academic discussion, mm. discourse. But for them, it's, it's real life. Mm. And I think that's what's missing. That's what made me come to the understanding that what we're talking in, the, uh, uh, in, uh, in classroom is inadequate um, and, and misleading. Mm. Right? So we, we have to really go uh, and live among uh, live among them for a long time uh, to understand uh, their perspective, uh, their day-to-day -day suffering, um, and then reflect on um, how this understanding can help us to make a better policies uh, and uh, to help us appreciate what we have in this country. It's, it's like the, uh, the French communists praising the, the Soviet Union. Uh, and, and your point is, I, I think, uh, you know, so well taken, and it goes back to at least what I think is is the real hypocrisy and the real condescension of these sort of arguments of saying, no, oh, the, the Islamic uh, Revolution had some redeeming qualities, as you, you say, sitting from, uh, I don't know, the New York Times office uh, in Manhattan. And Iranians see that, they say, okay, if you like it, you come live here. Let's, let's, yeah. switch, let's switch places. Yes. Let me come to New York and you come live in uh, yes. Islam. Yes, till that moment you sit in the cell in Evin prison, um, I, 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 I think it's, 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 um, it's really condescending, as you said, yeah. Well, well you, you talk about uh, prison, and you've obviously talking, talked about this 
extensively. Before before talking about prison, and, I have a question that okay. I want to give these people the benefit of the doubt. So, so you went to Iran as a you're very generous, eh? as an academic from Leeds University, living in Vanak, uh, which is a good place to live. So, what what kind of people you saw there? I, I assume like the type of people you see there, these are like upper, upper middle class uh, people educated. And then you went to prison. I think you see like different type of people there. Did you see any significant difference between the views that you heard outside prison and the views you heard inside prison? Uh, remarkably, not a whole lot different. Um, uh, yes, so I lived in a kind of an upscale neighborhood, um, but the uh, people I dealt with on the street not, not necessarily uh, uh, well off your upper middle class people, right? Um, I think two in two occasions, uh, people on the street, young people in their 20s, uh, grabbed me asking me how they can get uh, asylum to my country, not knowing I'm American, right? They just want to go anywhere. They, they just wanted to go anywhere. Uh, you can see that sort of a desperation um, among young people, and that is heartbreaking because because uh, 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 Iran has a, a, a overwhelming, uh, over, a, a very uh, young uh, population, and then when the young population don't see hope in their own country, it, it it's a, it's a problem, right? Um, and then, uh, and the uh, and the people on the street would, would 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 tell me how frustrated they are about about the situation, about the regime, right? Um, and then uh, 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 once I, I I took a taxi, uh, you know the uh, how how taxis work in Iran, uh, uh, usually share taxi. So uh, the driver was was uh, was uh, was a woman, and. Uh, uh, all the passengers then got off, and then I was alone in the end. And then she said, "I, uh, I, 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 I can't take you further because y- y- you're a man." Uh, and then, uh, uh, and um, uh, she said, uh, and pointing to her hijab, said, "I don't like this. I want freedom." Right? Uh, see, in other countries that we take for uh, 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 what we take for granted. Uh, isn't the case in Iran? Like a woman driver couldn't drive a male passenger, and then she felt uh, 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 necessary to explain uh, to me as a foreigner uh, that her lying for freedom. And I think that's very sad, uh, given given such a dynamic um, uh, uh, society uh, uh, that Iran has. Yeah. Young, well-educated, Young, well-educated, all these well-educated, where they, they, they had no uh, no opportunity, a uh, limited opportunity. My my, my Persian teacher uh, was uh, a, a student uh, at the University of Tehran. Uh, he, he he told me his major was Italian, so <laughs> uh, he speaks Italian, speaks English fluently, uh, and then he he said. Um, he couldn't get uh, a full-time job at uh, the Dehuda, which Dehuda would pay him. Uh, two hundred forty dollars a month uh, for uh, uh, four hours teaching every day, for uh, two hundred forty dollars a month. How can a person make a living like that uh, in in Tehran? Uh, a, a talented, well-educated young per- uh, professional. And so he had to take uh, uh, he had to take a position elsewhere um, as a as a as a journalist. Uh, and he's he's a liberal-minded person, but he said. Well, I could only find a position in the far, uh, uh, you know, far, far, far right wing, you know, far right uh, outlet. I had to write things that I don't, I don't believe. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's a, that's that's very sad. So I heard stories like that. I I, I can go on on, yeah. on and on about this, small and big frustrations from all levels of the society, from uh, from a man, from women, from young, from the old. Um, now even even clergymen, right? Um, and they have their legitimate uh, concerns about why the situation is not working the way it should. Mm-hmm. So, well, one thing that's that's inter- so interesting to me is again you've talked about this a lot um, in, in different ways, um, but 
certainly about your own experience. So you're in Iran for four months, and then you're jailed as a hostage, not a prisoner, as a hostage, for 40 months. Yeah. What, what were some of the, again, aside from, of course, uh, the, uh, your, tr- your awful treatment at the hands of the regime, what were some of the experiences you had with fellow prisoners, be they political prisoners or be they normal prisoners? Because unfortunately, as we know, one of the tactics the regime uses is to put political prisoners alongside common criminals to intimidate or threaten or even harm them. Um, what, what were the, who were some of the people you met? Maybe not names, but what, what were what was that like? To meet these people because you spoke fluent Persian, of course, at the time, so you can. Well, I, I, d- I didn't speak fluent Persian. Oh, you did. So, you uh, so, so I I, um, I was forced uh, to speak Persian uh, in the in the first three months of my uh, in, uh, arrest. Um, nobody around me spoke English. Uh, I, I had to speak uh, uh, Persian. That's how I got uh, fluent. I, I I I would say so. Uh, in the school. Uh, I got a good foundation. Right? Right. I, be, I became functional. I, mm-hmm. I could say what I wanted to say, but really um, uh, becoming uh, uh, comfortable in talking Persian, it, it happened uh, in the Edin prison, mm-hmm. unfortunately. So I was with uh, um, all kinds of uh, Iranian, uh, Iranian prisoners, uh, Iranians uh, from all walks of life. Um, so I was with uh, embezzlers, uh, you know, corrupt officials, um, uh, uh, people who circumvented the sanctions, uh, laundered money uh, for the regime, um, but couldn't get to, you know, uh, 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 how, how do I put it? Um, but has a, uh, has a dispute with the regime about how to divide the money. Right. Um, uh, so they, they got thrown into the prison, uh, people like that. And then former uh, government officials uh, embroiled in uh, political disputes uh, um, uh, and um, uh, political dissidents, uh, members of the Mujahideen uh, Halk, uh, uh, also uh, journalists, reporters, intellectuals, um, and uh, 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 people who posted uh, on Telegram things they shouldn't have said, uh, and. Um, uh, other uh, foreign uh, dual national uh, uh, hostages, uh, occasionally petty criminals uh, as well, um, and uh, yeah, you name it. I, I think I've seen people very wealthy, very extremely wealthy uh, uh, Iranian elite uh, business uh, businessmen, uh, former regime insiders, uh, down to the, the very. Uh, low uh, level, uh, very bottom per- strata. Purse snatchers. Uh, yes, of, 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 of people who actually uh, had to struggle uh, at the day to, you know, on day to day level. Uh, Iranian minorities, Sunnis, uh, Kurds, Baluchis. I really learned a lot. I, you know, my, my 40 months in, uh, in prison was really like a, a, a field work uh, for me uh, that allowed me to. Uh, delve into uh, delve in deep uh, um, with the uh, in, into the Iranian society, uh, hearing different perspectives, uh, s- different stories uh, of of of, uh, of um, uh, uh, different in- individuals. Mm-hmm. Side is I mean you you were you know uh, also in prison. What is you know? I, I wasn't. I wasn't. With, I was. By myself there, so yeah, no. I'm 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 the only one here who hasn't been uh, in the Islamic Republic's prisons. Like, well, that's God, but... that's not something you want to. Uh... <laughs> but you yeah. you you two have. So I mean, what is you were in a, a different situation, uh, Said? Obviously, um, yeah, I was. I wasn't a VIP, so I was a I think 20 years old student then, and they took me with my own car to have been to IRGC uh, prison. I was there for like a uh, month, so and they it wasn't like they didn't like shoot it. They didn't want any information from me. To, they just wanted you know there was a student uprising then, and they wanted some people to say like you know we made mistakes things like things like that, and but I didn't go to uh, 
I was I was mostly alone there, so I didn't meet any other person. Most of the time, uh, I didn't see anyone. Like I just see inside. I just mostly I saw inside myself. So when they wanted to bring bring you somewhere, you had to put something on your eyes, and yeah. So yeah, yeah. And when they were interrogating you, you you couldn't see your interrogator, so you sat there you and he was behind you uh has it changed because i was there like in early 2000 that's about right that's about right uh my first uh, interrogator i could see him um because he questioned me uh well i was outside the prison i saw him uh so he he never uh, asked me to wear a blindfold during interrogation uh, for that reason i suppose but then when they forced me into confession they changed an interrogator uh, and in the process was exactly like uh, you described, um, that I was sitting on the, in the corner of the room, uh, facing, the, uh, uh, facing the wall uh, with a blindfold, and um, the interrogator was uh, yelling behind me, uh, uh, you know, put me under, uh, putting me under uh, duress, uh, um, and, and, and then forced me uh, into, into confession. Uh, just to uh, make it clear, that they wanted no information from me. Mm. Um, they never even tried to ask, uh, like, uh, you know, as if you would think if, if they really con consider me a spy and have done something wrong, uh, at least they would try to force me to say, uh, you know, what, what uh, information do you get uh, uh, or, um, you know things like that. They didn't even try to do that. So, so to you, how early on in your imprisonment was it clear that this was a hostage situation? About a month into the imprisonment, because the first eighteen days, I had a daily interrogation for a couple of hours. They would ask me the same question over and over again. It's all about my bi biographic information, uh, how I grew up, where I was born, where I went to school, what I studied, or, you know, my my my, my work history. Uh, my views, my political views, uh, my understanding of international politics, uh, uh, Iranian history, Iran-U.S. relations, China, uh, you know, things like that. Um, uh, and then it, I thought, you know, none of this uh, was incriminating and uh, they, they must be investigating me. Uh, so once they found out that I really didn't do anything harmful, they would let me go. Uh, so by the 18th day, they told me, uh, we have investigated you thoroughly. We don't think you've done anything wrong. We've written a, a, a good report about you. Uh, we'll take you to our, our chief if he decides that you, uh, you are uh, innocent like uh, we think you are. Uh, he will let you go. Uh, or at least you can wait for, uh, you know, he will release you on bail and then uh, you can uh, wait for your process outside the prison. Uh, so I was hopeful, and then they took me to Hotel Esteglal uh, in the suite. Uh, an old man came, and he told me, we're going to ask you some questions, and uh, we're going to uh, analyze your facial expressions uh, to, uh, to see whether you're telling the truth. Uh, so if my consultant uh, um, uh, comes to the conclusion that you're uh, truthful, then we'll let you go. And then they started filming. Uh, they asked me the same questions uh, during the uh, as as they asked me during the interrogation, uh, knowing exactly how and what I would say. Uh, and um, and uh, uh, not very long into the the the, the, rec the video recording, I realized this is not really about telling truth or you know uh, saying the truth. Because they were asking me objective, like a subjective question, subjective questions. What do you think of this? What's your opinion on that? Um, you, that just can't be wrong, right? right? Cannot be judged right or wrong, because that's personal opinion. Uh, but then, uh, for a person in that situation, you just, you just want to believe that there is a slim chance that they would understand that you, you, you're not harmful. They'll let you go. So I had to play along. Uh, and then um, uh, by the end of the day, it was really clear it was just uh, a video shoot uh, for propaganda purpose for the future. 
Um, and um, so after that, they took me out of the solitary confinement and uh, I was allowed to call my wife the first time. Uh, and then uh, they didn't come to me for 10 days. I was waiting, hopefully, that they would release me. But uh, instead of releasing me, uh, 10 days later, they suddenly started interrogation again. Uh, in two sessions, uh, they forced me into confession, uh, telling me that uh, um, uh, that I, I need to confess as Americans uh, to be a, to being an American spy because they needed me to be a spy to achieve a prisoner swap deal with the United States to repatriate uh, their prisoners uh, in the U.S. They, they were that clear, but they were they were that clear because I think. Um, you know, it, 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 it was very, very clear from day one what they wanted to, to do with me. Uh, and they knew I have no intelligence value. Uh, they didn't even try to press me to say, uh, you know, to, to, to say things that I didn't do. Or um, it was just completely, completely a scam, you know. And uh, they, um, they told me because I think... Uh, for their purpose, uh, you know, why do we spend time on this, right? So we'll just tell him uh, what we need, and he would understand there's no point to resist. He would, uh, he would tell us what we need, and that's it, right? That's exactly what happened. So they, they uh, told me, uh, you have to confess, uh, otherwise there, uh, there, there would be no deal. Uh, and then that's uh, uh, to your detriment. Right, so uh, if you don't confess, you will never be able to go back to the U.S. You will never be able to see your wife and son. Uh, nobody will remember you. You will rot here uh, in the prison. And if you don't confess, uh, we'll send you back to solitary confinement until you confess. Um, and uh, again, um, they didn't ask me uh, for things. They didn't ask me to say the specific things I didn't do that would uh, clearly incriminate me. For example, like uh, going to a, a, a restricted area, collecting restricted information, because all my research information, uh, all the research uh, data that I collected are publicly available information that any Iranians can go to the archive and put a request for that material. And the archives exist for scholars, right? right? So none of the stuff that I uh, collected as classified or sensitive or confidential. Everything is uh, um, a public record. Uh, so they didn't even try to force me uh, uh, to say that. The only thing they asked me to say is I'm a, a spy for the United States in English and Persian. And that's it. Uh, I, I, I felt that I was, I betrayed nobody uh, but myself. Uh, I felt almost like a rape, right? Uh, loss of honor, um, and um, uh, uh, I was completely uh, insulted and disgusted. Um, but I, 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 I think my conscience was clean because I didn't betray anybody. Yeah. It had um, no impact on, on others. No, no, no impact on others, right? I was the only one who suffered. Um, and then I didn't know uh, at that point uh, that according to Iranian law, uh, the confession itself is adequate to convict me. Uh, no evidence uh, or witness uh, necessary. The confession itself will give me 10 years, and that's what happened. But one thing we need to understand about Iran is that the reason they can do this is that all the judges and courts are working with them. So. If you so the the judge really that when you go to the court the judge really doesn't try to understand the case so the judge has someone from the IRGC they tell him for example you have to give him this uh, amount of prison or something like that so the judge doesn't try to you know investigate the case or something like that and if you try there saying that so these were forced confession then the judge says okay so we have to start the process again. So for someone like Shui, it means that he has to go through that process again and there, there will be no different result. Um, and then I don't, you know, I don't think they even wanted to go to that trouble, right? 
So they said outrageous things uh, in in the in in the courtroom. Um, for example, uh, as I have written in my op-eds, uh, that uh, the interrogator asked me uh, what I thought of U.S.-Iran relations, and I thought, well, uh, U.S. and Iran uh, may not like each other; they may not want to be friends, but there can be a relation, right? And, and then, uh, 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 like uh, U.S. and China uh, could have a relation, U.S. and Iran can have a relation too. I think Obama should visit Iran and normalize uh, uh, the U.S.-Iran uh, relations. So he said at the time uh, in the interrogation that we will never, ever welcome a U.S. president to visit Iran. A U.S. president will never set his foot on Iranian soil. So, but my my statement that Obama should visit Iran was used as evidence against me in court. Uh, saying because Obama wants to engage with Iran, the engagement itself, in the you know, from the regime's uh, perspective, is uh, is a means uh, to bring about regime change. Mm. Therefore, in the regime's rhetoric, Obama's uh, engagement is uh, iron fist under a velvet glove, um, and uh, 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 apparently, uh, I said um, Obama should visit Iran. Therefore, I'm an accomplice uh, um, or agent uh, of uh, America's um, uh, uh, regime change uh, scheme. Um, uh, therefore, um, I need to be persecuted uh, and uh, uh, convicted uh, for that very crime. So I was convicted as a, as a, a spy slash infiltrator, yeah. right? And then also, I want to say, and you cannot believe in a courtroom, in a, in a, in a, a, a serious place, a solemn place like a courtroom, uh, in front of a Judge Salavati, this, this, this can, can come up. Salav uh, my advisor at Princeton is America's uh, uh, best uh, Soviet uh, expert. Uh, so he wrote books about how Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, completely scholarly, right? Uh, he wasn't uh, engaged uh, in the uh, in the process of uh, Soviet collapse, uh, but he wrote a study of it. So, but Salavati said, "Your professor uh, single-handedly brought down the Soviet Union, right?" So he sent you to Iran for part two to bring down our regime. Um, and I said, well, how is that possible? Um, I, I, I'm alone. Um, uh, I don't even speak Persian fluently. Um, I only came here with uh, uh, $10,000. Uh, and uh, how could I even, even you know, contemplate uh, to bring down your regime? And then he's, Judge Salavati said, of course you could not. Because before you could do that, um, our uh, wise supreme leader and there were very capable uh, uh, agents of uh, intelligence uh, have stopped you. That's why you are here. We prevented you from doing any harm to our, uh, uh, to our system. I mean, it, if, if this weren't so tragic for you, this would be like a comedy show. Exactly. So it's really a farcical pros a process, right? How could this... Uh, how could this be true? I, I would ask myself thousands times, thousands of times every day, how could this be true? How could this happen in the modern world, 21st century? I have done nothing wrong, and I came to Iran with a good will, and I say that to people around me. I came here with a good will to, to learn Persian, to, to study your history, uh, to appreciate your culture, to, to, to write an a, 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 a episode or aspect of a history uh, that, um, that has not been presented. I want to share the positive light uh, to, uh, uh, to the Iranian uh, 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 society, uh, about the Iranian society. And, and, but why is this happening to me? Right? So, but yes, that's just the sheer reality. Said. So, if you don't have any other question about the, his time in Iran, I want to ask some questions about when he came back. Go, go ahead, go ahead. So, 
uh, I'm being honest with you. So when you came back, I, I said, oh, oh, this is another <clears throat> hostage being released. Now he's coming. He's, he's from a Leeds University, uh, <laughs> liberal background. Now he's coming back to the U.S. Here's, he starts using his, you know, <clears throat> credential as a hostage and saying that the regime is, you know, the regime is reformable. These people who got me were the hardliners before me start good. And it was really like, a, <clears throat> I was quite surprised when you started talking about uh, Iran in the US and you were saying the same things that I have been hearing from Iranian people. I have been hearing from dissidents and it was, I was quite surprised and I want to thank you for that. And But I also have the question, why do you think so many people who have bad experience with the regime, but then when they go to the free world, they are not very critical of the regime. Like, I, it's very hard for me to understand that. Um, well, because I think I had a, such a transformative experience uh, in Iran, I went in uh, with naivete, um, I totally trusted what I have learned in classroom, what I have read uh, from academic books, uh, the typical Saidian uh, uh, rhetorics about the Middle East, uh, Saidian interpretations about Iran-U.S. relations uh, in the last couple of decades. Um, but the, you know what happened to me um, has proven. Uh, that this line of thinking is inadequate and uh, largely wrong. Uh, again, because it ignores Iranian agency, right? And then also thanks to the, uh, the my interaction with the Iranian people uh, on the streets uh, of Tehran, in the uh, you know uh, 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 in the prison uh, with again Iranians from all walks of life, they gave me a thorough re-education. Uh, that uh, really revised my understanding of Iran. So my understanding of Iran um, uh, was uh, um, uh, rudimentary when I when I when I went to Iran. Uh, again, I wasn't a Iran, uh, trained as an Iran expert, but much of what I know or what I believe about Iran today is uh, derived derived from that period of re-education by interacting with Iranians. Do you think the fact that you were not trained as an Iran expert, you were not part of this community, which is which has a very biased views on Iran in general, do you think that contributed to you? Uh, uh, that has, um, I don't think that has a decisive uh, uh, Contribution, uh, contribution to the way that I, I understand uh, Iran today. But what does make a difference is that I have decided I don't want to be that, you know, part of that uh, Iran studies community. Uh, you know, uh, because imagine, uh, you know, many people who had a bad experience in Iran but somehow became uh, part of uh, the Iran studies uh, community. Um, you know this. This is this, you know this is a very practical issue. Uh, the whole scholarly community uh, um, is taking a specific kind of a direction, a specific kind of view. If you want to flourish and survive in this community, you have to play according to the expectation and role of, of the game, right? Um, and then, uh, 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 and then as a result of 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 that you may not be able to really say what you truly believe. Um, I think that's the peril of the, uh, 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 of, the, of the situation. There are many people who understand the problem, uh, but, but they choose to be quiet. They choose not to be critical, right? Because it's a very realistic, it's a very realistic uh, professional and career consideration. I mean, these people have to, uh, you know, to live on um, being part of the academic community that waves this kind of inaccurate, uh, at least, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, presentation 
of of uh, um, of Iran. And how were you received here? So, you came you came back and you said things that you know challenged what they they have been saying. This Iran studies community in general, many of them, and. How, how, how were you received by them? Because you, you're coming with, you know, strong credentials of spending like 40 months in prison there. So it should not be that easy to, you know, attack you. Uh, well, sh- of course, it's not easy to attack me. So they don't attack me. Uh, so they don't attack me. Uh, but they don't engage me uh, either. So I'm completely ignored uh, by Iran experts. Um, no Iran experts. Uh, reached out to me, uh, uh, academic experts. Uh, those uh, a few of uh, people, uh, you know, uh, a few experts I spoke to uh, because because we know, I, I knew them. Uh, we're, we're you know we were acquaintance, uh, so we had some pre- private conversations, and that that was it. And then so no Iran studies uh, scholars try to. Uh, uh, Try to contact me, reach out to me. Uh, they didn't. They invite you to talk to their students, you know, in their seminars, give talks, nothing like that. Absolutely not, even a single incident. So, uh, again, I'm completely ignored um, by Iran scholars. And, and some of them, again, we no need to name names if you don't want to. But some of them, even you know, when you have what I perceive to be when I see them. Perfectly logical, perfectly respectful, perfectly um, level-headed discourse on Twitter. Let's say they block you. Actually, yes, uh, yes. A number of a prominent uh, Iran experts blocked me on social media uh, without, without even direct communication. Because what you're saying is, is I imagine, inconvenient for their narrative. Right. So I'm. Uh, 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 um, so uh, for them. I don't exist. As simple as that. I have to add one point so people who watch this understand. So one of the things that these people sell is their access to Iran, like their lived experience. Like, for example, saying I have been in Iran like over the last five years, two times, three times, four times. And it's absolutely astonishing that someone has been there for 40 months in prison saw so all kinds of people, and they have no interest in inviting him, letting him to tell their students, their peers, what he saw. That, that's really astonishing to anyone who understands the, the field. Let me also add to that, right? So when I came back, it was still under the Trump administration. So Secretary Pompeo uh, invited me to, to his office uh, to discuss about Iran. Uh, the Iran representative Brian Hook uh, had a long discussions, uh, not only once, uh, at least twice, long discussions with me about my experience in Iran. Uh, he invited also invited me uh, and my wife to talk to his entire Iran team. Uh, I was invited uh, to to the to the White House to talk to the national sec- uh, you know security team about my experience in in, in in Iran. This was under the Trump administration, uh, but. None of the current Biden administration officials has ever reached out to me or showing any interest to hear what I have to say wow. about Iran. Wow. Yeah. And, and you, you are still among, if not the last American to come home as a hostage from Iran. Is that right? Right. Uh, well, there's a uh, Michael White. Uh, right. Yeah. Around the same time. Uh, six months la- yeah. after. Yeah. So, so one, one of the last... Americans to be held as a hostage by an adversarial regime, if not an enemy of this country, has not been invited by our leading national security experts to, right. to discuss this topic. No, uh, uh, none of them reach out to me. Um, um, to me, it's, it's, it's really, really, really curious. Uh, if you're not even, you know, because the United States never had, uh, for 40 years, over 40 years, did not have a, dip- a diplomatic relation with Iran. We have no uh, underground knowledge, right? Um, and I thought, uh, at least uh, my experience in the belly of a beast uh, should have some reference value to policymakers. And yet, they're not interested. Mm. 
Well, it, it's, it's fascinating what, what Said says because it, it's, it's not only that those people um, use the fact that they once, you know, went to Iran for two weeks and stayed at their aunt's house in some, you know, ritzy neighborhood in North Tehran and went to the best restaurants and nice shopping to say that they're, you know, holier than thou. They also use that to discredit those who have not been to Iran. So they use it to say, uh, Said al-Qasemnejad, who he hasn't been to Iran since 2008, never mind the fact that he can't go to Iran because he would be summarily imprisoned and, and unfortunately probably worse. Uh, you know, th- they use that to discredit others. Yet when they have someone like yourself who was there for 40 months, as you say, in the belly of the beast, they block you, they treat you as if you don't exist. I mean, to me, it's really, it, it, it's a perfect example of the hypocrisy and, and condescension that you talk about in the academy, you know, playing out as, as your life, really. Yes, but, but also I, ha- I should say, uh, uh, every time when I publish something on Iran, I receive uh, emails uh, from mostly Iranians, uh, Iranian Americans, I, I suppose, but also uh, non-Iranians. Every time I, when I write something about Iran, somebody would uh, read it and email me and, 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 uh, and thank me for uh, uh, sharing my, my, uh, uh, my experience. R- regular and, people. Regular people, yeah. not, not you know, uh, yeah. not scholars, yeah. uh, but those who are genuinely uh, interested in Iran, care about what's going on in that country. So I think there there is a tremendous uh, uh, interest uh, in this country uh, on Iran, um, uh, uh, among Iranian Americans especially, um, and uh, yet um, I'm I'm so disappointed uh, that uh, many so-called uh, Iran experts um, uh, are not interested uh, in what uh, I may have to offer. Mm. Right. So if I were in their position, I'll probably at least talk to the guy sure. and see if if you know if he has something to offer. Right. Maybe I don't agree, and I I would dismiss him. But at least perhaps it's useful to talk to him. Mm. But I can say not a single Iran expert has mm. done that. Said, we're, we're almost out of time here, given uh, uh, Shui still has a, a very busy schedule uh, for a, sh- a short trip to Washington. Do you, do you have any last questions? If not, I, I have one here, but you go ahead. I have just one last question about <clears throat> the whole hostage situation, because there are still uh, oh, hostages. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, but take what I said uh, back uh, just for one minute. Uh, Professor Abbas Milani at uh, uh, Stanford yeah. has been uh, very supportive. Mm. He did invite me uh, to uh, to talk to uh, his students mm. uh, at Stanford. It just 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 hasn't happened. So Abbas, mm. Professor Abbas Milani is the only um, uh, uh, the only exception. Mm. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, I I would have done uh, in, injustice uh, yeah. to him. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's worth worth mentioning because he, yes. he, interestingly, I mean, you know, whatever he's he's um, he's one of the people I think, at least in my perspective, people can have different uh, views on on Dr. Milani, but he's he's one of the few people who has, over time, at least in my assessment, been willing to change his views and express the fact that he has changed his views on some issues. Um, so I, I'm very glad to hear that he. Invited yes, you. yes. So Professor Abbas Milani has been a tremendous source of. Uh, uh, um, uh, support in that regard uh, mm. for me, uh, knowing that I'm not completely uh, uh, ignored. Mm. I'm, and I, I am looking forward to uh, talking to Professor Milani uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and his, uh, his that's, students. That's great. But that's, this, that's is the only, this is the only exception. Only one in all only. of academia. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you to th- Dr. Milani for, for doing that. That's, that's excellent. Yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah, there are other hostages in uh, American hostages in Iran. And the discussion is that some people say like the Trump administration's approach uh, was bad for releasing the hostages and the Obama and Biden administration's approach is better. It can be more successful. What, what do you think about that? Uh, that's totally wrong. Uh, so my understanding is that the Trump administration brought back three U.S. hostages uh, from Iran. But uh, the Obama administration obviously had success with a huge cost by releasing Iranian assets 
basically like a monetary uh, transaction uh, uh, that uh, you know uh, th through which uh, he was able to bring back Iranian uh, uh, American hostages in Iran. Uh, but I myself, I believe, uh, was a collateral damage of of that as well because that obviously had the effect of. Uh, Encouraging the Iranian regime to take more hostages, and and and, and here, and I, I really have to say, uh, former Obama officials, no matter how they want to spin it, they released they run the the assets, one point seven billion dollars uh, of Iranian asset to Iran. They may say it's not ransom, uh, you know, this is the best deal we can get. Never mind that the Iranian regime interprets it exactly as a ransom, and then they acted. As if America paid ransom, so let's take more Americans. That's exactly what happened, right? And then the, look at the the the, the, the so uh, the way that American hostages are, were released under the Trump administration. None of us, none of us was released through any monetary transaction. No sanctuary relief. No release of Iranian assets. Um, I was exchanged uh, with an Iranian prisoner. In America, who was due to be released for time served in a week, had I, had there not been exchange, he would be released anyway. Mm. Um, so my conscience is clear. Um, the United States did not, under the Trump administration, did not put more people in jeopardy because of my release. And I praise uh, the effort that the Trump administrations uh, 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 um, and, and and many others, uh, not only the administration but also. But also uh, uh, other organizations, institutions, uh, uh, put in uh, into uh, uh, my release uh, to, uh, to to achieve my release. But look at the Biden administration. Uh, nine months into the Biden administration, not a single American hostage has been released from Iran, and then um, Iran uh, has. Uh, increased its demand um, for America uh, from America in order for the release of uh, um, American hostages. Um, I'm very pessimistic uh, about the, the 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 direction that things are going, uh, and I hope the Biden administration would use leverage um, and make the Iranian regime understand. If the hostages are not released, there will be consequences. And there are consequences. There shouldn't be ransom paid for their for their release. They should be released because they are held uh, 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 with trumped up charges. They are held unjustly, right? They should be released. Period. It's 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 a it's a it's so interesting to hear that from you because it's it's difficult for those of us. Who have not been hostages, and you know, not really fair to say you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't pay this cost, uh, you shouldn't pay this ransom, because we get Americans in exchange. But in in your situation, you were, as you put it, the collateral damage of such an action. So it's not merely a transaction of dollars for hostages; it comes at further human costs down the road. Yeah, we we have we have all seen that uh, ever since uh, maybe before. Uh, uh, President Biden came to office. The signal of re-engagement, uh, um, uh, meaning uh, in the administration's term, diplomacy through diplomacy. In my term, I would say appeasement um, uh, was clear, right? From the uh, uh, even before uh, Biden took office. And look what we have achieved. The United States um, relinquished its credible deterrence over Iran. Um, uh, military deterrence. I mean, and then refuse to use uh, leverage, allowing uh, China uh, uh, to buy Iranian oil uh, against U.S. sanctions to allow the regime to fa stay financially afloat, right? Um, and then um, uh, basically turning a blind eye to Iranian proxies' destabilizing behavior in the region, right? Um, releasing a. Uh, 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 frozen, blocked Iranian assets uh, to Iran in the hope that Iran would uh, come to the negotiation table, negotiate in good faith for mutual return to the compliance of a JCPOA. Did it happen? With all these uh, concessions, right? Yeah. It didn't. 
Iran arrested more hostages, not only American, but the, 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 the citizens of American allies, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, 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 and are demanding even more from America and American allies. Yeah. Um, well, they're making uh, advancements in their nuclear uh, capability. Mm -hmm. Again, without consequence. Yeah. So how far do we want to see this process going? So, so last question, you're pessimistic. I think a lot of us probably share that pessimism, at least if we keep going at the current pace with the current staff and personnel for the next two and a half years or so. Um, we, we've talked about this a lot. You're not, you're not an Iran expert by training, but because of the situation to which you were forced, you spent so much time focusing on Iran you know, since your release. And obviously, as Sai said, I think there are many people who are thankful to you for that. What's uh, what's next for you? Will you continue to work on Iran, talk about Iran? I mean, what, what's, what's the path forward for, uh, uh, for you specifically or, or broadly? What, uh... I, I would continue to uh, talk about Iran to share my experience. I think, again, my experience has some uh, uh, reference value. Uh, it should have some uh, reference value to scholars and policymakers, and uh, I'm committed to uh, uh, sharing my experience and, and understanding of Iran and, and deepening my understanding uh, uh, um, uh, and knowledge uh, about Iran. I hope that uh, uh, one day I will be able to, to make a, a, a more positive policy uh, impact uh, through my knowledge. Um, uh, so uh, that's in my mind. I think I'm going to do that. Yeah. Well, we, we, we we're thankful for you sharing your knowledge with us today and with our listeners, and uh, you know, really thankful that that you joined us uh, today, and uh, looking forward to to seeing more of you in the future. So. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. It was it was great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you, Said. Uh, thank you, Kamran. Thank you. Thank you uh, it's been wonderful to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, folks, for joining us for this first episode of our second season of Iran Uncovered, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.